this government no longer works. It needs constitutional, probably some subconstitutional also, but it needs constitutional change. This 18th century document, which was the creation of a small group of landed white males, is not only out of date, I mean, that's a long argument, but it's out of date, believe me, okay? But it is also biased. You know, it's a historic moment, I think. It's a historic moment because we've really hit the wall on the economy, on jobs, on the climate, on student debt, uh, on the crisis in the African-American community, the crisis of police violence. People aren't going to sit there and invest their hopes in exactly the parties that have gotten us into this mess. If there is one thing America has truly learned this political election season, it's that we need alternatives. The current two-party system just doesn't cut it for a nation that has become so diverse in so many ways. There are other political parties out there seeking your vote, people who are becoming increasingly tired and irate over having only two candidates to choose from. There are others out there, of course, but far too often they get buried in the white noise of multi-million dollar campaign ads and media outlets that are partisan hacks for one person, one party, and one way of thinking. There is an undercurrent in this country demanding change, and the current is getting a lot stronger. You're going to have the chance to opine in mere moments, only if you are on the hard line and waiting when we call you. Queue up now at 1-877-NEWSMAX, 1-877-NEWSMAX. And the main question to you will be a simple one. Are you one of those who demand more choices and believe both Republicans and Democrats are burying your right to seriously choose? Our first guest is not a political insider, not someone who buries himself in double martinis and kickbacks inside the Beltway. Go back to 1980. He ran for the Senate in South Carolina, suggesting even then radical change was needed. His long resume has brought him to the position as a candidate for the Green Party presidential nomination. They've had a national ticket every presidential election since 1996. Welcome William Kreml to the hard line. William, thanks so much for joining us. And what we just heard you say and what I just introduced you as forces me to ask one question. Is it just the perfect time for a third party? And we are hanging in the balance right now. This country's got to have one to make this country better. Uh, yes, sir. If not now, when? Uh, look just at the level of the dialogue, even before you get to the substance and the ideology and what positions on issues you take, look at the level of the dialogue. I'm from Illinois, and my mother uh, took me down to what we call the pilgrimage in Illinois. And, you know, we looked at Lincoln's home and, and uh, you, uh, you know, out where he worked there in, in New Salem and so forth. And I, you know, I started with the Lincoln-Douglas debates and so forth. I don't expect every election to be the Lincoln-Douglas debates, but I'm almost 75 years old and I remember Adlai Stevenson, I'm sorry. And on the other side of the ideological spectrum, I remember Bob Taft. Bob Taft was a wonderful man. He was a little stiff, a little formal. Some people didn't like him all that much, but he was really a very good person. But let me stop you if I, I can, because it, it's great to talk the history here. But how then do you and the Green Party speak to the younger voters, the millennial voters now, the people who are in their 20s, 30s and 40s and make them believe that a third yep. party's got to happen now? How do you do that? I, I think you go back to Thomas Jefferson, which said, uh, who said that every generation has a chance to have its own revolution. And, uh, you know, the old uh, tried and true has not been tried and true. So that's that's what I say to the younger folks out there. You're entitled to have a government that works for you. Some of that, I think, will be structural change. And as as uh, we all heard, and I think that was from the uh, New York uh, uh, presentation, it means constitutional and subconstitutional change. Don't forget your phone calls one eight seven seven Newsmax if you care to join us. Do the Democrats and the Republicans fear you? It would not seem as if they do at all. Oh, oh, no, no, no. In fact, they not only don't hear me, they don't want to hear but me. But do they fear you? That's the thing. The fact that you might steal some votes from them and change things in the Electoral College. Are they well, afraid of yeah, you? They're gonna, yeah, they're going to do their usual whining like they have for the last 16 years about Ralph Nader. Anybody who investigates that knows that that is absolute BS. Nader did not cost uh, uh, Al Gore the, the election. Uh, but yeah, to get back to your to your question, I started this in 1980, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time, uh, uh, you know, showing you things. But this is the TRB column of the New Republic in the spring of 1980, 
when I was running for the Senate and saying we need a constitutional commission that looks at our system because it's failing. And then this is what we gave to the President of the United States and the congressional leadership. The uh, Bicentennial Analysis, the American Political Structure, Report and Recommendations from the Committee on the Constitutional System. We gave that to the President and to the uh, Congressional Leadership, 1987. Wholly ignored. Wholly ignored. And that, I think, is the point that a lot of people are talking about, that they will still ignore you. Hang tight for just a moment here, because we're going to be joined right now for balance by the presidential historian and biographer of Ronald Reagan. Craig Shirley also joins us here on the show. I want to bring you into this, Craig, because, again, it comes down to that fact, and I think that Mr. Kremel has a point here, because there are still some people who just want to ignore this whole thing. They want it to go away. They don't want to worry about the Green Party. They don't see him as anything that could really change things, but it would seem as if we are right for that change right now or are we overestimating no i don't think so i don't think we're all actually i think we're always right for change is that you know uh just after the uh the constitutional convention benjamin rush one of the framers told uh, wrote a letter to thomas Paine, and he said he said the, the the war is over but the revolution goes on and by that he means is that America is always in a constant process of change, and we've seen it down through the ages, of the changes of uh, women's rights and, and slavery and the environment and other things like that. Often, those radical ideas that start with reform movements, whether it's the Green Party or uh, Teddy Roosevelt's Bull, uh, Bull Moose Party, are incorporated by the two major parties. Now, uh, the factionalism of the two major parties was, uh, was is not what the framers and the founders intended. George Washington, in his farewell address, warned against factionalism. But that is the way uh, the system is has evolved. And I don't know. I mean, I welcome third, fourth, fifth parties. I think they're terrific for the system. I think they stimulate debate. I think they bring new ideas. And uh, otherwise, the two parties would become too arrogant, too stodgy, and too stuffy. Uh, so, uh, from the historical perspective, actually, third-party movements have been quite useful in bringing issues to the fore that Republican and Democratic Party historically have not been willing to address. Let's grab a couple of phone calls in here for our two guests. Rich from White Plains, you think a third-party candidate is very viable. Why? Well, Ed uh, and guests, with the unpopularity of both presumptive candidates, there's absolutely room for a third party. And an example of one candidate's unpopularity showed yesterday in the, in the Washington State Republican primary. It was a closed primary where only registered Republicans can vote. John Kasich and Ted Cruz had dropped out of the primary race before early voting began, and still, combined, they received 20% of the vote. Bill, let me come to you on this, too, because there's something here that is on the other side of what Rich just said, because he says very viable. However, here's Mike from Parkman, Maine, who thinks the third party candidates are not viable and are a waste of time. Mike, why do you say that? Because it would seem the American public. And as a matter of fact, I want to bolster this argument. If you look at the polling from data targeting, if the election today was held, would you select Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, or a truly independent candidate? This is not a fly-by-night poll. It says 21 percent said they would pick the independent candidate. So, Mike, from you very quickly, why do you say it's not viable when the public says different? I have no idea. After listening to Craig, <laughs> I kind of agree with him. So you have no idea. You have no, no idea why they're not viable. You just decided to go ahead and say that so that we would come to you and have you make the statement. Exactly. Okay, thanks a lot, Mike. As a matter of fact, please don't call again, because quite frankly, if you don't have a take, we don't need you. We do need you to weigh in on this right now, William, and that comes down to what he said. But these are people out there who are naysayers, but the American public is in here saying, yes, we need them. I got about 30, 40 seconds left again. What is it you've got to do at your convention, you and Jill Stein, in order to grab the American people by the throat? We're going to offer something that is very different. And, and that's, that's the important thing. There are new paradigms out there. I won't go into the long lecture. We don't have time. But there are whole new ways, not just of, of designing our government, but of thinking about our government. An awful lot of my research and writing over 50 years, I, I graduated Northwestern Law School in 1965, has to do with not just our government, constitutional law, but also how we think about it. And Americans are entitled who have the kind of government that they want, they're smarter than these semi 
uh, educated people who are, are running the two parties. I'm going to tell you, I don't think you're going to have a lot of arguments with that, with people who would say that there's a lot smarter people that should be running the country. Uh, we want to remind people, check it out, a green party at gp.org. Learn a little bit more about them. See if indeed they are something that you want to consider. William Kreml, congratulations uh, in your run, at least. Let's see what happens at the convention. We thank you for joining us. Uh, and by the way, we apologize for the clown car being open momentarily here moments ago. Thanks <laughs> nope, for joining no us. Problem. No Kreml worries. It, it happens all the time. Craig Shirley will return for another go round and more of your scintillating phone calls as we turn to the real power in party politics. And whether let's consider this seriously, we are at a crossroads in America that will have consequences no one on the right or the left really wants to talk about. And a lot of that comes down to the Constitution, which is what William Kreml talked about. We'll talk about that. Some of the history here of third parties. 1-877-NEWSMAX. 1-877-NEWSMAX. Don't worry. I'm ready for you. The Hardline continues.